So hello and welcome to another episode of Top Tens. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. That's Carl with a K and Smallwood is very unfortunately spelled the way that it sounds. Let's move on. And today we're talking about 10 wild facts about Yellowstone National Park you may not know. And something I like to do in these videos, as well as on the sister channels, Biographics and Geographics, is note who wrote the script the video is based on, because they deserve some credit too. And that person today is Jesse Clark. You can follow them on the social media links they provided for us below. I'm also down there, if you don't believe my name, is really Carl Smallwood. It really is. I did grow up with it. I went to a very rough school. Again, let's move on. You can also like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. But without further ado, let's get to it. Established in 1872, Yellowstone National Park is a vast expanse adorned with snow-capped mountains, dense forests, towering cliffs, a diverse array of wildlife and unique plant life, and notably an abundance of, and this word's probably going to cause some controversy, geezers. I did look up the pronunciation and geezers is correct, but I know Americans like to pronounce it geysers, so I'll use both of them interchangeably to make everybody annoyed. And in addition to geysers, there's also other striking hydrothermal features. Given all of that, it's no wonder that this park, which sprawls some 2.2 million acres over three US states, conceals a treasure trove of secrets. Let's take a look at just a handful of things you may not know about the park. Starting with number 10, it was the first national park in the world. Yep, Yellowstone National Park holds the distinction of not just being the country's first national park established on March 1st, 1872 by US Congress, but the first of its kind in the entire world. And this all started with the Northern Pacific Railroad Company's plans to expand tracks into Montana near the present Yellowstone area. Recognising the tourism potential to bolster the local economy, the company advocated for a significant expedition in 1870, which generated several attention-grabbing reports about Yellowstone's natural scenery. This endeavour set the stage for the Yellowstone Park Act in 1872, which placed the park under the guardianship of the US Department of the Interior. Area, safeguarding it from private interests, like railway companies. So, to clarify here, a profit-driven corporation pushed for the park's protection from similar profit-orientated entities. The world's just weird like that sometimes. But before 1872, the notion of national parks as we understand today had not materialised. So while things like natural reserves and state parks like Yosemite existed, the idea of federally safeguarding attractive land purely due to its intrinsic natural beauty and curtailing commercial exploitation there was a novel concept to say the least, and thankfully one that has since caught on. Moving on, number nine, more than half of the world's geezers are in Yellowstone. I know geezer is the correct pronunciation, but to me the word geezer just means an old person. So I keep, like, you know, like Danny Dyer would say, or um, Jason Statham in a movie, of like, all right, you geezers. It just sounds like that to me, so it's very funny. But Old Faithful might come to mind when you first think of Yellowstone, but it's just the tip of the geezer-shaped iceberg. Yellowstone National Park is practically lousy with geezers, boasting a staggering 500 of the things, give or take, scattered across its entire area. In fact, Yellowstone harbours more geezers than the rest of the planet combined. And the secret to all of Yellowstone's geezers is that Unlike many places on Earth where mineral crystallization seals up geezer producing cracks and vents, this doesn't seem to occur as much at Yellowstone. Yet, geezers aren't the only hydrothermal stars of Yellowstone. This dynamic landscape is in a perpetual state of shifting and rumbling, giving birth to an array of hydrothermal features. And the most common and popular of these are hot springs, which is highly recommended you don't go enjoy, because every single year, without fail, there is a story of somebody who goes to enjoy a hot spring, not realizing that it's actually a geezer and gets blown some 30 to 40 feet into the air and killed. You have been warned, but these hot springs are formed when rainwater seeps through the Earth's surface and gets superheated by volcanic gases below. Additionally, there are mud pots, fumaroles, also known as steam vents, and travertine terraces, limestone transformed into mesmerizing formations by rising thermal water and heat-loving organisms. I'm surprised I got through that one in one take. These are all part of this geothermal ensemble of sorts. Geysers, those majestic towers of erupting water, are actually the rarest hydro thermal feature created when heated water struggles to reach the surface due to natural blockages resulting in massive jets of hot water. Which more than anything shows how much of a curiosity Yellowstone is, given that it literally contains over the half the world's supply of these incredibly rare geothermal phenomenon. Speaking of rare geothermal phenomenon, number 8, Old Faithful is slightly less faithful than you think. Yellowstone National Park stands as a top-tier travel destination for nature enthusiasts craving vast, untamed landscapes you can't find anywhere else on Earth. That's just teeming 
with lots and lots of wolves and stuff. With its expansive mountains, dense forests, abundant wildlife, sweeping steppes, and a multitude of lakes and rivers, it encapsulates everything an outdoor enthusiast like Ron Swanson could dream of. But there's one iconic image that dominates Yellowstone postcards. Old Faithful. Old Faithful, indisputably the world's most famous and renowned geezer. Again, to me, that's really, really f I want to start saying geyser, because I just keep thinking like Michael Caine when I say that. Old Faithful, indisputably the most renowned geyser in the entire world, earned its moniker by faithfully sending towering plumes of scowling water high into the sky with almost clockwork regularity. No trip to Yellowstone is considered to be complete without witnessing this natural spectacle, with a near guarantee of experiencing its awe-inspiring eruptions, shooting over 130 feet into the air. So also for this reason, Yellowstone officials say do not go near near it, but people keep doing that and again keep getting horribly killed when superheated water um, at incredibly high pressures get shot directly into their face. Like, just don't do it. Over the years, however, Old Faithful has subtly deviated from its punctual nature. Initially erupting every 60 to 70 minutes when it was first discovered in the 1870s, it now follows a slightly more, shall we say, relaxed rhythm, more fitting of the times, boasting intervals of 77 to 78 minutes. Various factors, including rainfall and seismic activities, can influence this interval period, but even with these changes, Old Faithful retains its well-deserved name and allure. I just like the idea that as it's gotten older, it's got slower. We all do. Speaking of old, number seven, Yellowstone has its own Grand Canyon. Okay, so it's not going to outdo the Grand Canyon, a household name, but the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone still holds its own. Born from the ashes of Yellowstone's supervolcano eruption from some 630,000 years ago, this canyon floats an intricate tapestry of multicolored rock layers, presenting researchers with a window into the region's ancient geological narrative. For casual hikers, on the other hand, the vistas stretching over immense distances and the sight of waterfalls plummeting up to 300 feet onto the canyon floor below make the journey entirely worthwhile. And who knows, a visit might also grant you a glimpse of rare birds of prey, like ospreys, showcasing their natural grace outside the confines of a zoo. And if you're still on the fence about taking a detour to this 20 mile long, 1,000 foot deep, and 1,500 to 4,000 foot wide expansive marvel, quoting explorer Nathaniel P. Langford's all filled words from 1870 captured upon his first encounter with the canyon, he induced profound introspection on his, and I quote, own littleness, my helplessness, my dread exposure to destruction, my inability to cope with or even comprehend the mighty architecture of nature which sounds pretty grand to us. Moving on, number six. Humans have lived there for some 11,000 years. So when Lewis and Clark ventured into what we now know as Yellowstone National Park during their famous expedition, they weren't exactly pioneering into an untouched wilderness. They were a little late to the gathering humans that had already set foot there literally thousands of years before. In fact, the first human settlements in Yellowstone date back roughly 11,000 years, a staggering span that predates even the earliest known historical records. And to put this in, in perspective for anyone out there struggling to comprehend how long ago 11,000 years was in terms of human culture, the ancient Yellowstone societies predate the ancient Babylonians by twice as many years as the ancient Babylonians predate us. Over millennia, these societies thrived, adapting to the changing, yet generally favourable climate that generously provided abundance of food and resources. However, the 19th century dawned and contact with... <sighs> Europeans and American settlers occurred, the narrative changed. Early explorers like Lewis and Clark, followed by frontiersmen, fur trappers, gold seekers, they all set their sights on the western frontier. Along with them came gunpowder, new cultures, languages, and unfortunately, the all too familiar tale of disruption for the indigenous peoples who'd resided in the region for countless generations. Ultimately, the encroaching United States government would extend its authority over the land, and uh, yeah. Again, a story for another day. We have to move on. To number five, Yellowstone has an obsidian cliff. Yellowstone's obsidian cliff might not be straight out of some cool ass dark RPG, but it's still pretty rad looking. The cliff's formation traces back to lava that cooled rapidly without crystallizing, resulting in thin, dark glass-like material known as obsidian. Given Yellowstone's volcanic activity, obsidian can be found scattered throughout the park in abundance, but this cliff stands out, a towering 98 feet of exposed vertical thickness that captivates the eye. And there's my new Tinder profile. Yet, the intrigue doesn't end at the just simple visual appeal of this giant big rock. The obsidian cliff holds a rich history, intertwined with human activity. 
activity. For example, the devastating 1988 Yellowstone wildfire cleared the cliffside of near enough all vegetation, offering researchers an unobstructed and unparalleled view to study its features. And there, investigations revealed that humans began mining obsidian from this mountainside almost immediately upon their arrival in the region, as mentioned, 11,000 years prior. The versatile material lent itself to crafting an array of tools and was valued for its sharpness and solid composition, making it exceptionally practical for early hunter-gatherer societies. Obsidian artifacts from this cliff made their way across vast distances, comprising up to 90% of the obsidian found in Hopewell tradition mortuary sites scattered throughout the American Midwest, particularly in the Ohio River Valley. Moving on, number four. You might be able to get away with murder in Yellowstone's zone of death. So while we certainly hope that you'd never find yourself needing to come here or being lured here by a partner you've had an argument with recently, if you're ever musing about the best place to commit a crime, hypothetically speaking of course, Yellowstone might surprise you, not for the reason you'd expect though. Situated in the vast middle of nowhere, the park presents a secluded setting, reducing the likelihood of being caught in the act. But that's not all. Like, obviously, you know, big secluded area is a great place to commit a crime, but there's something else happening here. An intriguing legal quirk that could serve as an unexpected advantage to those considering such dark thoughts. The so-called zone of death in Yellowstone's Idaho region. Though thankfully never utilised or challenged in court, legal scholars point out that a curious scenario in this remotest part of the park could occur. In the unlikely event that a crime were to occur here, a shrewd defendant could and we're using and could a lot of heavy lifting here, invoke their Sixth Amendment right to be judged by a jury from the state and federal district where the crime transpired. Now, the twist here lies in the jurisdictional arrangement. Wyoming governs all of Yellowstone, including the portion located in Idaho. However, since no residents occupy the Idaho section under Wyoming's jurisdiction, convening a jury becomes a effectively impossible task, stalling any trial or legal repercussions. A quirk like this certainly wasn't in the minds of the founding fathers when drafting the Constitution, but perhaps it's a nudge for Congress to consider redrawing these legal boundaries to avoid something horrible happening. Moving on, number three, forest fires here are par for the course. In Yellowstone National Park, forest fires aren't just a destructive force. They're a vital and routine part of the natural cycle, as horrifying as they can be. Fires play a role in the rejuvenation of the ecosystem, acting as a sort of cleansing force that literally levels the playing field, enabling surviving plants and animal species to flourish once the smoke clears. The process results in a diverse mosaic of plant communities, each growing at their own pace, which is crucial for maintaining a robust and vibrant environment. Typically ignited by lightning strikes in dry areas or arseholes having picnics, these fires have a positive impact on nutrient cycles within the ecosystem. While most fires are relatively small and self-extinguishing, the arrival of European settlers shifted the dynamics somewhat. Settlers aimed to control and contain the fires to protect certain species of plants and animals. However, this human intervention disrupted the natural cycle that had shaped the local environment for centuries, if not millennia. Despite the benefits of controlling large fires, the challenge remains, particularly with climate change exacerbating the risks of uncontrolled and massive wildfires that can occur seemingly at random. And I guess we have to mention like the greatest Simpsons clip ever of like, who can prevent forest fires? You pressed you, referring to me. That is incorrect. Moving on once again, number two, Yellowstone is an earthquake magnet. As mentioned briefly, Yellowstone National Park is perched up a colossal magma chamber responsible for more than half of the world's geysers and geothermic features. It is no stranger to seismic activity. In fact, the park witnesses a staggering 700 to 3,000 earthquakes each and every year. That's an average of two to nine earthquakes every single day for the last several thousand years. Now, the park is characterized by earthquake swarms, which is terrifying to think about due to its numerous faults, vents, geysers, tectonic features, and the continual movement of magma between the chambers. Basically, all the stuff that makes Yellowstone such an attractive place to visit is the reason why there's just earthquakes all day, every day. Fortunately, not every visit to the park involves being jolted off cliffs or encountering boiling water spouts. The majority of these earthquakes are minor tremors that the article refers to as an essential for maintaining the, what they refer to as, 
open plumbing systems beneath the Earth's surface. These quakes prevent mineral deposition that could otherwise seal off the parts remarkable and famous geysers. Moreover, the frequency of earthquakes provides researchers with invaluable insights aiding in mapping and understanding the distinctive subsurface geology of the region. Still, the idea that there are things called swarms of Earth... Like anything that travels in a swarm is something I don't want to be near. And I didn't think that, like, you know, acts of God could move in a swarm. And speaking of acts of God, number one, the Yellowstone supervolcano could kill us all. So we, we have to mention the Yellowstone supervolcano. People online love talking about the Yellowstone supervolcano that could kill everyone on Earth. So let's take a dive into the chilling scenario of the Yellowstone caldera eruption, an immense supervolcano lying dormant beneath the National Park and the potential devastating consequences. And it's quite a grim forecast. And if this supervolcano were to awaken, it would likely mark the most catastrophic natural disaster in recorded human history. It would probably be the single most like you know, catastrophic things to ever happen because there wouldn't be any recorded history after this volcano erupted. So leading up to the eruption, the park would experience months of escalating earthquakes as the colossal magma chamber beneath the surface stirred to life. And of course, we'd be able to track that, right? It's not like it has dozens of earthquakes every single day. The final catastrophic quake would align with an 875 megaton explosion, instantly vaporizing 90,000 people with its shockwave. While most of the lava would either fall back into the crater or just stop flowing at a considerable distance from the epicenter, humanity's ordeal would be just beginning. So enormous ash clouds will be spread out in virtually all directions, shrouding nearby states like snow and releasing about 200 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. This would obscure the sun and instigate a decade-long climate cooling phase, plunging the world into a global volcanic winter, devastating crops and triggering widespread famine, compounded by the spectre of lung cancer due to ash fallout. Yet, the reassuring note here is that the likelihood of such a super eruption happening within the next few centuries is considered smaller than a catastrophic asteroid impact on the Earth. So, fingers crossed, giant asteroid 2024, end it all. Let's go. So I hope everybody at home found this video to be entertaining, informative, and educational. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things. And if you are inclined to agree, you can go let the author know by way of following them on social media. Cheers, Jesse Clark, for this one. As I mentioned at the start, you can like the video, comment below with feedback, suggestions, anything you'd like to cover in the future. And as always, you can subscribe for more and go out there and have the day that you deserve. Cheers.